Welcome to Urban Fantasy PH. We are creatives who live in an urban society and give readers wish fulfillment by way of our stories, which is fantasy, but reflective of reality. Here, we get to talk to fellow creatives like writers, authors, artists, comic book creators, filmmakers, you name it. We create and share our art here in the Philippines, as well as abroad. My name is CJ Edmonds, I'm your host, and here is today's episode. Good morning, fellow bookworms. Hello, book hoarders, book lovers, and creatives. Now, it is another Wednesday, and we promise to make it extra special for you all. Now, this is episode 27 of the podcast, and like always, and during an ongoing season, our show is aired every Wednesday, both for Spotify as well as on my YouTube channel. You have the option to listen or to watch us. The choice is in your hands. We leave it to you. So whether you're listening or watching, please click the subscribe button and ring the bell so you do not miss a single episode and you will be duly notified when a new one comes along. Now, like always, all of our past episodes are all ready for you to return to or listen to or watch chronologically if you are joining us for the first time. Now, today's episode, we have another international guest. Yes! (laughs) While logistically she's based in the U.S., her heart is definitely Filipino. Now, she is an award-winning writer who won the grand prize at the 2011 Carlos Palanca Memorial Awards for Literature. And for our international audience, the Palanca Award is our equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize there in the U.S. Now, this is for her debut novel, The Mango Bride, which now is going to be adapted into a movie starring the one and only megastar, our favorite, Miss Sharon Cuneta. Now, she has also released The Pandemic Bread. This is a nonfiction essay about interpreting for the end of life calls during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, that work was in the top 10 stories of the San Diego Decameron project. Now, that equally has been adapted into film and stars Princess Ponsalan and Becca Godinez. Now, outside of writing, our guest organizes fundraisers for survivors of domestic violence and serves fellow immigrants in her day job as a phone interpreter. Mm. That sounds interesting. Um, How many languages does she speak? Because she's an interpreter, we can ask her later on. Uh, We know that she she is all Filipino, but from hearing what she has accomplished and continues to do this all day, we know that apart from being all Filipino, she is also all heart. So a heartfelt good morning to Ms. Marivy Solipen. Hello. Hi, how are you, CJ? I'm good, Ms. Mary V. Welcome to Urban Fantasy PH. We are so honored to have you uh, here today, to join us here today. Um, If there was anything that I did not cover during the intro, Uh, (laughs) is there there something else you would like our audience to know more about? (laughs) No, I think think you pretty much got everything. Pretty much everything. Okay. Um, I love it when people discover that there are other facets to an author's life uh, apart from being an author and being one, I guess for some, it feels like we're, we're some, we're some kind of mysterious being that locks themselves in a tower only later to come out with a, ta-da, with a finished script, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, uh, sorry to debunk the mystery folks. It does not work that way. All right? <laughs> uh-uh. no. no, it doesn't. But speaking of work, um, everyone will have their own system of working. Was it, something that you discovered earlier on or perhaps this was a process of tweaking and eliminating as well uh you mean my day job or your your writing? your 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 system of working let's say as a your 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 author process oh um well first i had to have a day job which is why i'm a phone interpreter because it's the kind go. of thing where you're getting you get stories every day because mm. every phone call is a different experience and Every immigrant has like a, you know, whether it's a end of life COVID call or a court case for domestic violence or, a, you know, a doctor's visit. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just every day you have stories coming at you. And so okay. it's a it's a rich trove of material. And also at the end of the phone call, you don't you don't have to think about it. You're all done mm-hmm. with that job until the next phone ring, next mm-hmm. call comes in. So it's very easy to then write in between. I mean, I've had other jobs where I used to be a preschool teacher and I was mm. just really tired at the end of the day because I'm in and about that. And, you know, you're just completely wasted. I mean, you, you have stories, but 
physically you're tired. So yes. um, after many years of trying different jobs, this seemed to be the best fit. Um, mm -hmm. And also it kept my hand on the pulse of the immigrant community, of which I am a strong part. And I felt like I, it was my way of giving back to um, our community in the United States. Nice, nice. So when you when you say phone interpreter, um, first thing that comes to mind is that you have that you speak to people of different nationalities or different language. Or correct my 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 impression of that. Um, Tagalog lang. Just Tagalog lang. Okay. Tagalog lang. Yeah. All right, so all right. if a hospital or a court system or a magistrate or a Medicare or insurance company calls and the that person they call that's a Filipino who is a patient or a client or a you know defendant if mm -hmm. they don't speak english they have okay. you know that institution is mandated to provide an interpreter and that's when i come in oh okay okay yeah. um how do you how do you balance that you know being being a creative and at the same time the obligation that you have to fulfill uh during your day job um i think it works really well because as i said you get stories coming coming at you all the time and it took me a while like the mango bride for instance was um it it was partly inspired by all of the the domestic violence yeah. calls okay. i started to i had to translate for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i got everything from 911 calls for domestic violence to um you know court hearings and after that i had like a whole bunch of like uh, actual conversations mm -hmm. that yeah. i felt like uh, a need to put down into a story because it was a story about immigration but it was also a story about domestic violence which is near universal sadly i mean it cuts across all socioeconomic lines um cuts across all nationalities and i felt like because especially here or actually in general anywhere but particularly in the, in the philippines which is the only country outside of like the vatican in the world that does not have legal divorce uh, domestic violence tends to be, you know, uh, swept under the rug because yeah, people are to say. embarrassed. And and what is the point of like, you know, appealing or talking about um, your violent uh, or abusive relationship or marriage when there is no way to get out of it? So, mm -hmm. so I felt that it was really important for me to bring that out of the shadows and so mm -hmm. provide a, you know, a vehicle for people to start talking about it. And in fact, one of the stories in Spooky Mall um relates to dom domestic violence i think it's um not migrant life but it's the one it's yeah it's the one about the the homeowner whose husband is a uh, drunk and he starts, yes yeah that one yeah that one that one and yeah. this is the book yeah yeah, yeah. yeah yes, thank you for here <laughs> yeah, the second edition that um andrea fashion flores at mil flores press decided to reissue after it had been out of print for so long oh wow i didn't i didn't know yeah. that this was the uh, second edition so yeah nice to know yay nice to know um if in case you're one of the few people who have the very first edition hey <laughs> send us a yeah. screenshot that would be great that would yeah be great. that one was actually published by um the late great tony hidalgo who was mm. Do you, I don't know if you've ever heard of him or if you know him personally, but um, before he passed, um, you know, he, we collaborated on Suddenly Stateside before, and I was kind of at loose ends and trying to think of the next project. And he said, well, why don't you come up with the adult version of Philippine Fright, which was published by Tahanan Books for Young Readers. And I thought about it, and I was going through this really angry period, you know, at the time, and my therapist was like, well, why don't you just write all of that rage down? And I'm like, okay. So I told, I, I got back to Tony and I was like, okay, I'll do it as long as you agree that the title is Spooky Mo. And thankfully he said yes, because I don't know if you picked up on it, but it is a pun. Yes, it is. <laughs> and I don't know if you received the, the Kindle version of it. I didn't uh, know you. Um, no, I didn't, I didn't get the, the, the Kindle version. Oh, uh, I sent you the email. Oh, you did. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I haven't. Yeah. Uh, I haven't opened that yet, but uh, I will. Yeah. Uh, but when on. you do it, and you put it them side to side, basically, when the um, American book designer, my friend Professor Tara Knight, found out that it was a pun, and she found out what the what the pun is all was, <laughs> he's like, "Oh, could you please put it? Please, will you let me put it on the cover?" 
I was like, well, if you put your scary cunt on the cover, then everybody in Amazon will start, you know, putting me in as like a <laughs> pornographic. The book will be flagged to no end. <laughs> well, but she said, no, 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 it's different with Kindle. Don't worry. And she, she made it really tasteful. There's a, okay. Yeah. Just look at okay. it. Okay, I, I I will I will surprise myself uh, later after the interview when I open the email yeah. <laughs> attachment. Yeah, please post it afterwards. Yes, uh, I, like with the recording, if you don't mind, um, because I thought it was really funny. Sure, sure, I, I'll, yeah. I'll do that. But uh, but let, let's let's go back for a bit for for Mango Bride before we delve into uh, to spooky sure. mode. Um, I was wondering how how soon did you finish Mango Bride when you started conceptualizing it? Did it take you about you know a couple of months or a little longer than uh, that? Actually, the the two okay. So this is the origin story of the Mango Bride. Okay. Essentially, I was writing spooky mode, and I happened to meet this um, agent Taryn Fagerness in the United States. And, you know, she came and gave a talk and she says, you know, if you have any material you'd like me to read, I'd, happy, I'd be happy to read it. So I sent her the manuscript of Spooky Mo, and mm -hmm. she liked it so much that she wanted to represent me. And wow. at the time, she was at the Sandra Dykstra in this um, agency, which Sandra Dykstra, Dykstra is Amy Tan's like agent, or mm -hmm. she was at the time. So mm -hmm. she went back to Sandy and she's like, hey, I want to, you know, offer representation to this one Filipino author. She has this really great collection of short stories. And Sandy was like, but nobody knows her here. And nobody debuts with a short story collection unless mm -hmm. you're like Jhumpa Lahiri. After she has like a novel. So Taryn came back to me and she says, do you have a novel? I'm like, uh, I used to be an advertising copywriter. And then I wrote flash fiction. And nothing I've ever written has been more than like 10,000 words. And the average novel is like 90,000. Yeah, 80, 80, and so I was like, no, I don't. So she basically said, well, then I can't offer you rep representation. So mm -hmm. that kind of lit a fire under my ass to try to write a novel. <laughs> so just to get over my, my, the hump of my fear of the long form, I joined um, NaNoWriMo. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> yeah. so I joined NaNoWriMo in 2008 in November. And as you know, it happens in November. And you have to write the novel, see what you know, fifty thousand words in thirty days. In with, 30 days. Whether or not you write, make the turkey. And I made the turkey. I made I made the fifty thousand you know word thing, and I had a novel, but it wasn't very good. So basically, I was like, okay, I have a fifty thousand word novel. I don't know what to do with it. I'm pretty sure I can't show it to Taryn yet. So I joined a writing group. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a read and critique group. Uh, led by Judy Reeves, who is a local San Diego like writing mentor to everyone. She's fabulous. And um, I said, can I, you know, join this reading critique group? And so basically there were eight of us and every two weeks I got to show a new chapter. So that basically nice. kept me going. So I, I, I um, edited each chapter as we went along and it took me two years. Are there a lot of um, writing groups there in San Diego? There are, I, I would no, say, nice. yeah, um, at least three that I know of. It depends on the genre. Sometimes okay. there are writing groups for memoir, there's writing groups for the novel, and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, so I, I don't really keep track. But, yeah, there are several really good ones. Nice. Yeah. I, I would love to see more writing groups flourish locally here, though. I mean. Oh, it, you should just it, start one. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I mean, it's basically you just need to agree, like a book club. You just need to agree. Okay, we'll we'll come up with a, a chapter to read, and you have to do you know, like, is it a twenty page like thing that you want to share every week, and how mm -hmm. often do you want to meet? And then you just trade um, feedback. But of course, you have to make sure that the people you invite are actually good writers, or at least and, writers and, and that whose writing you admire. Right, right, or at least able to you know to. To, to meet the deadline or you know the, the days that you're supposed to be meet, meeting because you know, people will always has will always have excuses for oh I can't make it this week because yeah. this and this and this and that. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. So it, it has a <laughs> commitment. And it doesn't have to be a very big writing group. It could be just sometimes you can have just a writing buddy. So it's just one person. Right, right. Yeah. True, true. Yeah. Well yeah. as creatives we we kind of like fall into the trap of putting pressure on ourselves or, or should I say added pressure to our own writing sked 
Sure. But when you're able to catch yourself doing that, uh, when you're sort of able to prod yourself into to shift your way of thinking that, okay, up until to this day, I must deliver or I can do it because this is my end goal, then, mm -hmm. you know, that's also important because that's part of your, you know, mental well-being. And, and for an author, it yeah. really is an important thing uh, for us to have our mental being uh, intact and all. Um, on the subject of mental health, as, as creatives, we all agree that the best way to deal with our own issues to speak of is, you know, to put what we feel, uh, what we assess perhaps to some extent, uh, what we go through, we put that on the page. And, mm -hmm. and maybe they say that's why the horror writer uh, or horror writers are the nicest mm. people in the world. <laughs> yeah. Like, I never um, heard that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> or if not yeah. the, the most well-balanced, like, you know, Stephen King, Dean Kuntz, Clive oh, Barker, yeah. Christopher Golden, to name a few. So oh, they're nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, okay. Stephen King uh, tweets, a, uh, tweets a lot. That is, if you uh, still consider X as Twitter. I still do. I, I, don't, mm -hmm. I don't like calling it X. I still... Uh, Call it Twitter, but yeah, um, he will tweet about political issues and and things that people are just not doing right or how people can be better. So yeah, it's uh, it's nice to see that that he does that. Um, so we move to yes to the book as we mentioned that we're featuring today, which is Spooky Mo. So we've kind of like touched on what the book is all about. Um, it's basically a collection of, uh, of horror stories that uh, involved uh, Philippine mythology or Philippine yeah. folklore or creatures of our own um, folklore. But uh, would this be the first time for you to write horror when, this, uh, when you finished this? Uh, no. Um, as I said earlier, I wrote the children's version. It was kind of like for middle readers, but okay. I was very benign. Um, it mm -hmm. was called Philippine Fright. It's also out of print. It's uh, it was published by Tahanan Books for young readers, and it um, it had some of the same characters. It had the Manananggal, mm -hmm. uh, it had the Tikbalang. So I think that came out. I want to say in nineteen ninety five or maybe ninety eight or something. Yeah. So, but that was for younger kids. So mm -hmm. it, it there was no violence. Was any any like, plans of uh, probably bringing it back or reprinting it? Perhaps. I don't know. That's a question for Tahanan Books. Uh, ah, okay. I would have to ask Renny Rojas, who is still my publisher. Uh, yeah, I, that's something I, I would have to take up with her. Uh, yeah. yeah. Fing fingers crossed, fingers yeah. crossed. But um, as kids, our definition of horror is, is usually limited to what we see on TV or what we grew up to associate horror with, which is you know yeah. from from ghosts to vampires, witches, werewolves, anything that has teeth and gnarly and growls at you and bites is considered horror. But as we grow up, we realize that you know both as a reader and now as writers that horror is is much more than that. So if you were to be asked, how would you define horror? Probably both as a reader and a writer. I mean. Different things frighten different people. I'm mm -hmm. personally not a fan of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Friday the 13th like brand yeah. of horror. I really uh -uh. I think that's just a oh, little so bit. I'm, I'm wearing the wrong cap then. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> it's <not. laughs> no judgment. I just find that that's a little vulgar. Just okay. because I think like, okay, so you saw the body in half or like all the guts are spilling out, but it's just gross. It's not mm. like psychological. Yes, I understand about the suspense. You know what's going to happen, but I find that um, you know, Get Out. I thought was really magnificent in the sense yes, that get, it was Jordan Peele did a great job. Yes, you know? psychological. That's yeah, great. I mean, of course, there was the gore at the very end, but there really was a build up to like psychologically of like this this building pressure and tension, the not knowing of, and I find right, that right. at least in my opinion, I find that that is a harder thing to do you know yeah. to, to paint the scene to lay the to set up all of the premises for what constitutes everything that you are most like terrified um of and then and then you do just one like quick thing where like all of that comes to fruition right but yeah. you don't like you don't slay bodies all along the way until like everybody's dead i mean i find that kind of corny that's what, also one of the reasons why I have not tried watching Saw, 
and yeah, I don't think I, 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 I don't think I ever happen. will. It's it's a little too it's a little too much. Yeah. It's a little too much and probably a little too too on the nose for me. But yeah, what Jordan Peele does is 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 awesome. Um, I, I take it that you may have also enjoyed the second film after Get Out. I did um, watch it. Oh, that one. Unfortunately, I did. Oh, that not. one. That one is good. Really. That one is good. I have yet to watch the third one, which is gone. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, that mm -hmm. I know that's on that's on Prime. So um, yeah. I'll get to I'll get to I'll get to see that. But yeah, yeah, but that one that one's good. I was like, I was I was flinching and squirming in my seat yeah. for that second uh, Jordan Peele film. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a good that's um, I I like what you said, but you know different things scare different people some people scare get scared easily some people will take a little bit more uh to get yeah. scared but if you build the atmosphere successfully um and you lay the groundwork for it um you'll you'll come out with a you, you'll get the reaction that you wanted to uh from both readers and, and film goers and, yeah there uh, was um there was a film with nicole kidman about um uh, oh the others yeah, see oh, that for that. me was I love like, that. you know this impending sense of dread as opposed yeah. to like oh I'm gonna throw up because I saw all of his innards. That kind of thing I think is more skillful and it's just I don't know I find it more interesting to be honest. Yeah, I I, I enjoy that. I enjoy. That. I got goosebumps yeah. watching that. I got yeah. that was that was perfect. That was a perfect horror film. Um, or The Shining. The Shining, I thought, was also masterful. Uh, I mean, it. yes, it was, it was bloody toward the end. But up until then, again, there's this sense of, like, foreboding. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something awful is going to happen. Because you see, right, right. like, what's he say? It's all, he was also a writer. Um, Jack Nicholson slowly going mad. So it's all about that, though. The things that happen in your head are sometimes more terrifying than what is actually laid out, you know, physically. At least, at least that's what I think. I agree. I agree. Um, your book has nine stories, um, all featuring yeah. the seven deadly sins. Was that a theme that you had when you first started writing it, or, or perhaps oh. maybe your editor pointed it out and then you just ran with it till you finished the entire collection? Actually, hey. no. I mean, Tony was a very hands-off um, editor. The only thing I remember him saying ever to me was like, "I think Talunang Manok is a little bit long." And that's okay. all he said. But everything else, like I came up with the idea of like, oh, it's a seven deadly things pala. Um, that was, and that was after I had written all nine stories and I was looking at them and I had to write like a blurb or an introduction. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, nga pala, parang that's all of them na. So it was not intentional. It was a happy coincidence. A happy, a happy accident. <laughs> a happy yeah. creative accident, which is good. Yes. Which is yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also have to admit that when you when I started reading, you featured a quote a quote from from my favorite author of all time, and who has you know profoundly influenced me both as a reader and a creative. Uh, and as per Anne Rice, the quote says, "Evil is always a possibility. Goodness yeah. is a difficulty." Curious as to why that was yeah. the quote that you used, and how much of that do you agree with Anne? Oh. Um. Goodness is what was the last part of it? Because I it was so long ago. Goodness um, is a is a difficulty, and evil is always um, a possibility. Well, I guess that could be one of the mottos of my life. Because I'm kind of mm. a bitch, so <laughs> I'm a little bit like I'm a little bit maldita. So I'm like, it's just easier like it's to go over there. Um, so I kind of have to struggle to be nice, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I have a daily yoga practice. Uh, at the end of every year, I make uh, cookies for my yoga studio, and I give okay. it to them, and I say thank you for keeping me out of jail. <laughs> thank you for keeping me like keeping me sane, working out through my help me work through my um, writer's uh, block, and from preventing me from punching out a fucking Republican. So all of that, like, salamat na lang. like I'm nice because of you. Um, and yeah, so pilgrimage is like my lifesaver. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, yeah, so I, I completely agree with that. It is a yeah. struggle to be a nice person because yeah, indeed. especially in this climate, like there, there are so many things that you could be angry about or frustrated about or indignant about. And 
Um, because I believe in getting all of that out of your system, I write. Yeah, that's the perfect way to get it out. Uh, right. So p pity the people who are not able to articulate themselves well and put that into a book. So it's like... <laughs> <laughs> well, those are the people who like go into a school and shoot everyone dead, or sad to say, yes, or like go on a like a rage fuel like Twitter, yeah, like, rant, you know, I know, or, I know. or road rage, yeah, yeah, yeah. That. So I, I like to think I choose the higher ground just because it's everything's just on the paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, just to keep geeking about Anne Rice, I was wondering what was the first book of hers that you ever read? And do you remember what did you like about it? You know, I'm going to say, this is my terrible confession, I have not read any of her books. <laughs> I really haven't. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I just never got around to it. My, my vibe is really more um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And, okay. Uh, Milan Kundera and you know I I mean the most I went in the furthest I went into like the horror genre sad to say is Edgar Allan Poe oh, okay so I'm super dating myself but you know no I, I just, Edgar Allan Poe is a classic you can never go wrong with Edgar Allan Poe so. yeah oh I did read Stephen King um okay. yeah so some of it I know he wrote something about it was an all about cats i think and that was uh, yeah, like yeah, one yeah. of the magazines in the yeah 70s. right um, um, yeah. um, um oh god that, that that became a movie with uh did it yeah i, I think that was if, if if it's about cats and it's the same one that i'm thinking about yeah uh sleepwalkers okay yeah, yeah so basically um i don't even think i watched the movie i read the book but i i can't bring myself to watch gore so so yeah so I did read some C Stephen King, but never Anne Rice, sadly to say. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. That's all right. He'll keep re he'll keep uh, releasing one every year, so you know yeah. uh, there'll always be time for it. But uh, let's go back to your books, <laughs> okay. which is this. We're talking Thank about you. this today. So my favorite stories in Spooky Mo were Bangungot, okay. Manalang Girl, yeah. Penitence, and Migrant Life. So mm -hmm. in uh, Manalang Girl, I was surprised that you included the aspect of Wicca, which is a recognized uh, religion in the US, in case people are wondering if that definition is merely confined within the parameters of the show Charmed back in the 90s, which I still love rewatching till mm -hmm. today. Um, I was wondering, were you able to speak to any Wiccans in particular when you wrote that? And, no. And, did, and Wiccan or, is a, it's a, it's a worldwide religion. Yes. I don't, I don't yeah, know yeah. that it started in the United States, but no. I did not. Um, oh, you did not. And I was wondering, did you think that you perhaps were giving the reader something new in the sense that while Wicca is originally from the UK mm -hmm. and Aswang is part of our local folklore, no one thought to merge the two together and make it as real as you have in the story. Who knew that Aswang can be worshippers of the, of the God and the sacred feminine at the same time? <laughs> well, actually, that, that story is really interesting because... I had the idea for the story and I and this is only the only time it's ever happened. I wrote mm -hmm. that story in one day. So Ooh. I just went through it really quickly and my whole thing was like, yeah, that's basically Oprah's show, you know, because she has such a cult like following. I mean, I love yeah. Oprah. And and basically I modeled it on that whole like the way she runs her shows. Um, mm -hmm. and I just put it uh, within the frame of Wicca. I mean, yeah. I live in Southern California. It's all very woo-woo and new agey yeah. over there. It's it's not hard <laughs> to pick up on things. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I had a lot of fun with that, uh, and there was a lot of puns, like terrible puns, with that um, with that story. But it was fun to write. Yeah, it, w it was fun to read, and that was the first thing that's that stood out for me. It's like you know, well, being Wicca myself. So, oh, um, you are. I, I, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, your your story also in Penitence this time around saw a Balikbayan named Tom and his friend Magda, and mm -hmm. they were documenting a group of penitents who were self-flagellating themselves on a Good Friday. Um, have you seen that in real life uh, when you yeah. were here? That was oh, you actually did. that was actually based on an actual 
visit to to that town because mm. my friend well who's now my husband was so like oh let's go watch this and i was like <laughs> oh my god like i mean i'm grateful that i went because otherwise i would never have um seen the you know i'd heard about it for years but yeah it was really hot i was really irritated and i'm like i mean i retired from organized religion like decades mm -hmm. ago and i just think it's um i know people have this panata and it's it really is like something that they you know seriously believe in and i respect that mm -hmm. i just thought they'll 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 wipe away all of their sins by flagellating themselves Tapos next year, and na na naman sila. So, right. I mean, are we really learning anything here? So, um, I don't know. I mean, I that was the Magda's perspective was my mm -hmm. perspective. Like, we are all sinners in this world. And some people choose to suffer, you know, for those sins in other ways than others do. I mean, my choice is, no, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it that way. So, so yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I, I get that. I, I get that. And and I think I also, I think at one time I also spoke to a priest and he also felt that, and I don't know why this suddenly came out from him and, and says that sometimes going to confession feels like a get out of jail card. Oh, sure. free. You know, in Monopoly, yeah. it's like, okay, yeah. I go in and confess my sins and then I'm yeah. done. And then when I go out, um, I can do whatever hell I want or at least, you know, feel that, each and every time that I go to confession, or for these people who, who do that, each and every time that they flagellate themselves, it's a kind of reset. That it's okay right. to fall off the wagon because right. I'm able to reset and start anew. Right. So you get to have a clean slate every every year or after yeah. every confession. And I think that's, I'm sorry, I think that's patently hypocritical. So, mm. you know, so, but I respect the, you know, Whoever wants to do what they want to do, if that gets them over the hump of their guilt, fine. It's just yeah. not my circus. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. So, you know, different strokes for different folks. That's yeah. It, it was true then, and it, it will always be true for 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 everyone. Uh, reading migrant life. This one, uh, I take it that you are a fan of the show Desperate Housewives. I was <laughs> at the time. I mean. That that was when I was writing it. That was the show that the the it show of the yeah time. yeah exactly the it so show. So it was just easier for me to frame it against that TV show. So mm -hmm. yeah, so it was fun. It was really yeah. fun to write. Um, I I enjoyed watch, watching the show then, and actually yeah. only made up until past season one. I was not able to catch up, but you know the story that you wrote was was campy as hell, and I loved it. And and yeah. I guess it's it's because of that as the backdrop of the story uh that you were successfully able to make it you know as campy as you wanted because of that back sure yeah yeah i mean that was just my top of mind story so i was like yeah i'm gonna go there so. right right and then if you use some other show it might have not worked in the way that it did no <laughs> no yeah yeah um also in the bio at the end of the book uh it says there that you've written 17 Books. Talk about being productive. What is the secret to productivity? Uh, well, those books were children's books. And so, okay. you know, like I used to tell my friends who were, you know, authors of long form, I was like, shorter words, more pictures. So not to diminish what I was, <laughs> my, my work at that time, but mm -hmm. it was just easier to get through. Like the yeah. first four were like basically prose poems published by Lori, Lori Tan at um, Bookmark. It was uh, The Unicorn, which I just re-released on Kindle. The Unicorn, Chun, The Toad and the Princess, and The War of the Rose People. So collectively, there can't have been more than a thousand words in all four books. And then mm -hmm. after that, Renny um, at the Hanan Books was like, maybe you should try writing middle readers. So I wrote a slew of um, four. They're called the Jenny and Jay Pinoy Private Eye series. And they were based on the, I don't know if you remember the Bobsy Twins. Yeah, the Bobsy Twins. Yeah, I remember yeah. my sisters had those on their shelves. Yeah. So the, the premise of those were, those books were like these two um, kids whose doctors, whose parents, whose parents are doctors, and they were living in the United States. And they just got into all of kinds of uh, 
you know, benign scrapes. There was a ghost in the subway in Boston. There was, uh, I forget, nah. uh, you know, various like mysteries that they had to uncover. And it's, they were like in middle school. Well, they weren't even middle school. I think they were in fourth and fifth grade. So, you know, really simple. And again, each, I want to say that each book can't have been more than, a, I don't know, maybe 3,000, 5,000 words. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so those are also out of print. And then when I came to the United States, I realized um, that I, I really couldn't, I couldn't write children's books anymore because I did not grow up in the United States and I felt like I needed to shift my focus. And at the same time, you know, when I married my husband who is Filipino American and we had to move to Berkeley where he was doing his doctorate, I was like, I'm not going to be like all of those other Pinoys who like, I'm not going to be a participant in the brain drain. Like I will move physically to the United States, but my brain will stay in the Philippines. So I continued to write um, for Philippine publishers. So that's that's when I got connected with um, uh, with Tony Dalgo, who looked at my collection of essays, which had originally been published in Leg Manila, Legion Enter- Entertainment Guide Manila, which is a, one of the earlier zines that mm-hmm. were um, that were published by friends of mine from UP. We we're all like ex faculty of UP, Isi Reyes, Trixie, um, I forget what her last name is, and Caroline Howe. And so, you know, they had invited me to write, um, you know, contribute articles to the zine about living the expat life in the United States. And so over time, I had like enough to put into a compilation of essays. And so Tony Dalgo said, okay, let's, um, I'll publish it. And I call it Sunday Stateside. And it's basically like, I don't know, about my travails, about being, um, the travails and challenges of being like a Filipina in the United States and trying to retain my culture, even as mm-hmm. I adopt to mainstream American culture. So there was that. And then I got pregnant. So Ipat Luna and I co-wrote Baby Love, which is about, you know, pregnancy in the, in, in the Philippines and uh, maternity and labor laws. It was a breastfeeding. It was kind of like how to, how to prepare yourself for pregnancy if you're in the Philippines including the labor laws related to all of that, breastfeeding guides and, you know, certain advocacies. And then I wrote a book about how to enjoy being single because, you know, in the Philippines, there's such a strong pull to be like, to get married fast. Or yep, get married there is. Yeah. If you don't get settled or, or have somebody yeah. in your life at a particular age, yeah. you're a loser. <laughs> you know, by the time if you're not married by 30, the only people you can date are people who are like separados or they already oh, have baggage. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, that book was sexy, sassy, singularly happy. So that was also Mil Flores Press. And then I think after that, Wolana, it was. I don't think I saw that uh, during the. or It's also uh, out of print. It's also out pre- okay, okay. All yeah, right. these are all like Mil Flores titles. And um, truth be told, like um, the reason why I have a Kindle edition of um, Spukimo was like a couple of years ago um, when Andrea Pashon Flores took over Mil Flores. I was like, would you like to republish uh, these essays? She's like, pass muna. So I, pu- I published uh, Spukimo on Kindle. And then when, you know, 108 Media decided they wanted to uh, turn by um, option uh, the Mango Bride to turn it into a film. Uh, she decided, oh, well, maybe we'll reissue it. Nalang. I was like, well, but I have the Kindle edition, right? So it's out already, but you're like, I'm very happy for you to come out with a print edition. So she did. And, yeah. that, and that's what we have. Right? Yeah, that's what you have. And it's a beautiful yes. cover. I it showed is, her the one is. for the Kindle and she's like, that's a little too racy for Manila. So <laughs> yeah, Manila's not ready for, for, for stuff like that. Yeah. But this is, you know, it's uh it's uh, it's tantalizing enough for you to to notice it and, yeah. and, and to pick it up. And, and 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 since it is the season of uh, spookiness, oh yeah, this October. is the perfect read for October. Yes, Thank yes, you. yes. We we uh, we're gonna let people know where they can get this. But I also, uh, in the bio, there's also there that uh, you had a hedge book writing residency in 2012. Now, I was mm-hmm. writing for those who are not familiar, what is Hedgebrook and what does a writing residency entail? 
Um, Hedgebrook was established by Nancy Nordoff, and it's on um, Whidbey Island. It's an estate on Whidbey Island that offers you each fellow like their own, her own, because it's specifically just for women. Um, mm -hmm. Her own little cottage, I call it like a Heidi cottage because it's a self-contained cottage. You have a, a you know, wood-burning stove at the first floor and a, a desk and a table for writing. And okay. then you climb the ladder and upstairs is your bedroom, you know, your loft yeah. bedroom. Yeah. So there's no internet in the cabins. And basically your whole, the whole premise is like Virginia Woolf's, a woman needs a room to write. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so you can apply for as, as little as two weeks to two months. At the time my child was young, so I only applied for two weeks. And so I was there for, on Whidbey Island for two lovely weeks. And uh, there were six other uh, writers, or I think they were all authors at the time, because they also have like playwrights, they have um, artists like painters come in. Um, so I had dinner, like after a day of writing or working on your art, you come to the farmhouse, which is the only place that has internet, and you have dinner with your fellow writers. And in the second week of my um, of my stay, Gloria Steinem came. Ooh. And she was writing her novel, or not, her memoir that eventually won the National Book Award. So it was a complete honor for me to be sitting at table with her and at in the, for a week for, for dinner. And at the end of... At, during that whole week, we would read passages from our own work. And I thought it was just such a beautiful experience because basically you apply by sending in like uh, two recommendations from other writers and a piece of your work. And um, one of the, the, the passage I sent in was The Mango Bride. Um, mm. so, so I was really honored to, to have been chosen. I think the year that I, I applied, because it's... it's um, they, they have fellows like all throughout the year um, and 40 were accepted from a field of a thousand applicants. So to be chosen was just a, a true honor. And I've, I've never, it was a life changing experience for me. I, I've always been grateful for that. I know, I know, um, I, I can only imagine. I know um, Samantha Soto um, does writer's retreats like that. Oh, um, she does, where? Yeah. Um, I, I think the last one was maybe off in Laguna or something or, nice. yeah. So and is it also expensive it's, uh, it's, um, I, I, I know you have to pay for it, but it's, it's oh, mostly, okay. uh, women writers. So yeah, may, you know, may, hopefully someone out there will, will do something for us guy writers. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, the yeah, thing I mean, about Hedgebrook is it's it's free. You only free. have to get there, and it's like you have a personal, you have a you know private chef, and after your dinner with the other writers, they pack you off with a little picnic basket. So all you have to do is like eat your lunch and work all day. And so work all day. Lovely. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, for us, probably there should be no internet and no video games. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That'd be the reward, maybe at the end of the end of a working day that you get to play. You know your yeah. your video game of choice from you know PlayStation yeah. One to Xbox or whatever. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Um, any any word of advice out there for aspiring fellow creatives? I know it's a it's a it's it's a question that's been asked so many times, but you know everyone will always have different things to say about their own experiences. Um. Well, for me, the first thing I always tell them is get a good day job. Um, because even as you work on your art, you have to be a uh, responsible, like yeah. unless you're married to like some completely wealthy trust fund person who's willing to support your art, I think you should be able to help pay your own way in the world, pay your bills, your expenses. And also it is a way for you to keep in touch with the rest of the world because yes, you can be stuck in your ivory tower, but you know, where are you going to get any ideas if you're just talking to yourself on paper? True. So, um, and also, the, my other advice would be to be a good citizen in a community of writers. Like, support other writers. When somebody else's book comes out, show up at their, you know, book party. Like, you know, support them. Because right. um, it's really, really hard to believe in your work. And I know, like, 
for all the you know work you put in sometimes you never get published or it takes years and years before you get published so you know books are milestones that need to be celebrated really loudly mm -hmm. so if you have a fellow writer in your group just show up for everything if they ask you for help like give them the feedback uh, you feel they need if they ask for it if they have a book party show up for that buy the books don't just yeah. say can you comp me one or if they offer oh you oh god that is oh i hate that i i hate that when, when yeah, people or if they say okay i'll send you an advanced review copy write an actual review yeah, right write a review on amazon because that helps um someone told me that if an amazon book uh, get a book on amazon gets at least 50 reviews somehow the algorithm shifts so that yep your you know all of that stuff because i mean it's sad to say that um uh, writing books now is not is as much about writing book as is as much about marketing the book as it mm -hmm. is about actually writing it and i find that really disheartening <laughs> because on the one hand yeah the, i understand the point about book trailers and the unboxing um, mm -hmm. thing on TikTok and instagram but it just takes away from everything else that you have to do to get to that point you know right and 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 there are some writers there who refuse to do that they they refuse to yeah. to, to to do the TikTok things like i will never do TikTok. i, I mean i'm, I'm gonna do that <laughs> I, I don't, I don't yeah do that. and i guess as creatives we we get bullied into thinking that oh because everyone else is doing it i should be on it but you know you shouldn't really pressure yourself again there's that word again pressure uh you shouldn't no. really feel that just because everyone else is doing it you're supposed to be there as well so yeah, yeah. i mean yeah when peg uh gave me my or decided gave me the book contract i was required to set up a twitter account and i mm. i never used twitter i probably have only a couple hundred and now with elon musk i just shut my trick because i think it's stupid and fascist and you know right-wing enabling so i just it's out but at the time i was told i need to have a twitter account um and i definitely had to set up uh, an author's page mm -hmm. so i think um, this other writer candy girl a kimple for showing me how to set it up um and yeah i did the bare minimum i know i should be doing more but really i i think i should spend more time just writing instead of marketing my stuff so right if, if you have a, an assistant to do that for you then you know that'll be great you know but that's that's what uh i guess that's what ai is for <laughs> no i mean um or virtual I actually, assistants. yeah no i actually used a, 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 a not a social media company but a company that's based in davao um for that helped me upload and i know they also do their uh what do you call it? They they also do um, social media. I just haven't gone around mm. to asking them because I feel like mm. I should do it myself. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. As, as long as it doesn't take you too far away from your writing time, then you know um, it's it, it should be okay. Uh, but let me borrow this question from Rachel Heron, uh, who has your own podcast, which I love. Hello, Rachel. If in case you're listening. I can tag mm -hmm. you here but what was the kindest thing that you ever did for yourself as an author the kindest thing oh i don't yeah. know i'm gonna have to get back to you on that because <laughs> I, I really can't think of you know as authors you're constantly beating yourself up about well did i use the right word for this did mm -hmm. i you know um I, I maybe really, when you reward yourself after let's say a writing sprint that would be probably you know a kind thing to do for yeah you. i mean i know definitely after i finished nanowrimo i went and bought myself something um and after every book event i would buy my my, my limit is 20 dollars because i okay. want to i don't want to go over the top so i'll i'll do something nice after like a book event just to mark it like i remember when i was still here um, after every book came out, I would buy like, I don't know, very small, like pearl earrings or something small, mm -hmm. something small, just yeah, yeah. As, to mark the, you know, just as a sense of closure. And okay. also like, um, yeah, to, to reward myself for completion. Yeah. But 
Yeah, I, I, I don't know. That's an interesting thing. Uh, that's an, I've never really thought about that. Yeah. But yeah, maybe, maybe moving forward, that would be something that, you know, we as creatives could can do for ourselves, you know, reward us for, for the little bit of good that we do. I mean, you know, if, if you reached or even um, surpassed your word count for the day, hey, why not go out and buy yourself a cup of coffee? You deserve that. You know, you know what I think, like though? I, I will add, though, that I think one of the kindest things um, you can do for another writer is write them a fan letter. Like when I, my, I have a habit of if I if I read a book that I absolutely absolutely like, I I dropped everything and sat down on the couch and read the whole day start to finish. I will write a fan. I I'll write a letter. I'll find that person's like um, email address or find a way to contact that person and say what I really liked about mm -hmm. the novel because I know when or a book because I know when people reach out to me and and tell me. Uh, I really like this, and this is why I liked it. I mean, it really touches my heart because writing is a such a lonely experience. You never yeah. really, unless you're at a book event and people are coming up to you and talking to you, you never really know what what is out there, how they're taking your book. And I think the nicest, one of the nicest things, a uh, person who read the the manga bride ever told me was like, she said something like, "I really love this book. I love this book so much." that I'm going to make my children read it, which is saying a lot because I'm only 18 and I don't have any kids yet. And I'm like, <laughs> oh. And I was like, oh, that's, that's so kind. Oh. Like, I mean, your future. And then, yeah, I, I, for me, that's like, that always makes me kind of choke up because- That's the best kids. review ever. That is yeah. the best review ever. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I had this one story that, my dear friend, I, I hope he's okay, Robert and Alejandro. He he um, he and I worked in a couple of like uh, books together. He illustrated my first book, The Unicorn, my last children's book, Chief Flower Girl, and uh, the Tagalog edition of The Mango Bride, which is also mm -hmm. now out of print. Um, and I remember that when we did the Chief Flower Girl together, he was so kind. Like I was getting, I happened to be getting married at the time. And so he based all of the illustrations on my actual marriage, wedding, I'm sorry. And um, years later, after it had gone out of print, people would get back to me and say, oh, you know, when my daughter was a flower girl for my sister's wedding or whatever, I would show her that book so she would know how to act. And I mean, just like when you think that this is how people, you know, save your book and how they use it in their lives, I find that almost you know, like heartbreakingly kind. It's just like, oh, you, you know, it impacted you and you're still using it. Like after you yeah. didn't put it down, you didn't give it right. away. It's, yeah. Stuff like yeah. that. Like I, I allow myself to be happy about things like that. And so anytime I find a book that touches me that way, I, I really do try to reach out to the author and say, hey, this was so wonderful and this is why. Same, same. I, I, I like to do that as well. Um, what is next on the horizon for you? Um, well, I'm I'm hopeful that uh, I can figure out like what's happening with the Mango Bride movie. Um, okay. Yeah, um, I'm I'm working on a sequel for Suddenly Stateside. Um, still trying to get that second novel published. Um, it's a historical novel set in the 30s about Filipino farm workers, mm. um, and everyone that's read it. They say in the states, at least, they're like, "Oh yeah, it's a it's a really good novel, and it's about a chapter in American history that nobody really talks about, and it's wonderful." I I just don't know how to sell it, and I'm like, "Yeah, I'm sorry, it doesn't have vampires or um, the Holocaust <laughs> or World War II or zombies, but <laughs> that's the story I wrote, and, and yeah, I, yeah, yeah. one day it'll find its home." So that is my only for hope. sure. For sure, um, um, you know, every book will eventually find its home. Um, for those who are interested in getting a copy of Spooky Mo this uh, October, um, where can they get a copy? Uh, apart, I guess they can go directly to Mil Flores, right? Mil Flores, yeah, I believe yeah. it's on fully booked. Um, the person mm -hmm. at fully booked, uh, I forget. I'm so sorry, I forget what her name was, but she did um, highlight Spooky Mo uh, in a in one of in the in fully books like um blog i think so she okay had a really nice interview so i'm pretty sure it's there 
I would think that it's at National Bookstore. I haven't been. I, I've only been here a week, so I haven't looked into the book things. And this funny story about um, National Bookstore, when it first came out, because I am Maldita, I ran around looking <laughs> in the bookstore, in National Bookstore, and I would just ask the sales ladies, Nasan Bang's Pokemon? And they would be all like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, Yung Libro. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was like, that was fun for a while. Um, and then I doing that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, anyway, Lord. Yeah. Where where can they? Um, I, I can only imagine the, the the you know the expression on the sales lady's face. Like, did I hear what she said right? <laughs> well, I do remember. This is just my comeback for like. I remember going there, going to a branch of National Bookstore many years ago, and I was asking the salesperson, "Could you help me find, please, Love in the Time of Cholera?" And they sent me to the medical section. Oh no! So I'm like. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so, like, you need to. De- so, but in that in that case, they had book they had shelved it correctly. So, no, okay. Yeah. No, I love National Bookstore. They were wonderful. They did such a wonderful job with um, the Tagalog edition of the Mango Bride. I I was told that Filipinos don't read in Tagalog very much anymore, sadly. So, I guess that book is going to stay out of print permanently. Um, but then, oh, don't remoto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dantan Yamoto translated it, and I think he was he did a phenomenal job. So hopefully, one day someone will decide to reissue that as well. All right. If I if I spot a copy, I will let you know. I will let you know. Probably eBay, because I must have bought up all the remaining copies. Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, or yeah. For sure, there 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 will still be some yeah. looking around. Yeah. yeah. Um, where can they know more about you and your work if they will also want to follow you on social media? I know you, you, you um, said you're not on Twitter anymore, but uh, maybe. no, I'm on Instagram where you found okay. me at yes. Marvy Sullivan at mm-hmm. uh, Instagram, Marvy without the first I. And then um, marivisullivan.com is my website. Okay. And um, yeah, I, I very rarely post selfies what i do is mm-hmm. because i'm really into food is i post cookies um uh, so just cook like I, stuff that i cook but i just wanted to say that one of my favorite stories in in spooky mo is talunang manok and many <laughs> years ago uh and it's based on an actual dish right many mm-hmm. years ago the the, the indie filmmaker she's a, actually a documentarian Marisa Arroy, who's based mm-hmm. in the United States, and I think now she's in Ireland. She came home um, on a Fulbright, and she produced um, and directed a, fi- a very short film adaptation of um, Talunang Manok. Um, sadly, she never uh, sent it to any of the film festivals, but I've seen it, and it's really good. Uh, well, I hope you know they, they decide to, yeah, they can put it up on YouTube for everyone to see, and they'll be... Well, I don't know. That's a conversation I would have to have with Marisa, but she did such a good job. And the other thing is like, um, uh, what is it? Pandemic Bread is making the rounds of the film festival. So I'm really happy about that. It's not a horror story. It talks about the horror of COVID, but yes, um, a different kind of horror, different kind of horror and princess Punzalan and Becca Godinez were just like these forces of nature. They just, I'm hoping that it'll come one day to the Philippines um, because it's only a 20 minute film, but there's, there's a world of like grief and family and, um, you know, and pain and, and the COVID of course, tragedy in that film. And for Zainabu Davis, the director to have captured that, I think is just nothing short of breathtaking. So hopefully, hopefully one day you'll see it. Hopefully one day we'll see it, yeah. Well, that is it. That is a, a wrap for today. Well, the links to where they can follow you, I'll also put that on the show notes, so no worries. If in case you guys didn't you know, get to write it down, um, I'll put it in the show notes. But that is a wrap for today. Thank you so much, Mr. Marivy Sarlovan, for joining us today on this episode. Uh, we wish you all the best in your uh, future writing and uh, film adaptation endeavors. Thank you also to Spine Books for your support since day one. If in case you are a creative and you would like to be featured in the podcast, simply shoot us an email. That's urbanfantasyph at gmail.com. If you wish to get a copy of the book Spooky Bo, just head on over to the Mil Flores Thank site you. at uh, milfloresspublishing.com or just check out your local bookstore. And if you don't have it, bug them to get a copy so you can get it. 
uh, as well. All right. Or you can get it on Kindle. There you go. If you prefer to read your books digitally, it is available uh, yeah. as well over there. Uh, on my end, if in case you wish to get a copy of Sojourn and Take Me Now, my two books on the Dark District, simply just visit the Spinebook Shopee page, which is shopee.ph slash spinebooks. You can follow the show on Facebook, Instagram, and now Threads, as well as me over at cjedmonds.com. Till the next episode, Indie Creatives Unite. Keep creating and keep reading. Stay safe, stay creative, namaste, and blessed be. Thank you, Ms. Mary V. Thank you. Thank you so much for the conversation. It was fun. Thank you all for joining us this week on today's episode. Next week, we have Mr. Jean-Carl Gaverza of Philippine Spirits as our guest. And if you are a fan of Philippine folklore and mythology, you know you need to tune in. All right. And if tuning in weekly to the show has been uh, part of your lifestyle and it has become your habit of late, we thank you so much for that. From the bottom of our hearts, we deeply appreciate it. Now, speaking of lifestyle, the Mega Brands and Lifestyle Sale returns this week, Friday to Sunday. That is October 13 to 15 at the Mega Trade Hall of SM Mega Mall. Now, the event, which started last 2010, is one of the longest running brand and lifestyle sales in the metro. And it is visited by around 20,000 to 30,000 shoppers every time. Admission, remember, is free. And just in time, not just for another payday weekend, but also for those who've already begun or just about to start their holiday shopping uh, at this time. So go visit the Mega Brands and Lifestyle Sale October 13 to 15 at the Mega Trade Hall number three of SM Mega Mall. That's this Friday already, all right? Now, if you are a creative and you would like to be featured on the podcast, as I said, simply email us at urbanfantasyph at gmail.com. All of the past episodes are ready for you to return or listen to chronologically if in case you're joining us for the very first time. Follow the show on Facebook, Instagram, and now Threads. Thank you, everyone, for today, and we'll see you next week. Bye. That was another episode of Urban Fantasy PH. Join us next time as we feature another creative soul who wants their art to be seen, heard, and shared. If you have your own work to share, just email us at urbanfantasyph at gmail.com. Till the next episode, this is independent author, singer-songwriter, radio personality, voice actor, and fellow creative, CJ Edmonds, reminding you to always listen to your heart, create with your mind, and share with your soul. Goodbye, everybody. Namaste. Blessed be.